Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 332 featuring Shay Sasanya, the co-founder and CEO of Gravity Sketch, the well-known VR modeling and, uh, and uh, design tool that's out there that's actually very, very well known. Kristen, what did you think of Shay's uh, uh, episode? Oh, this was great. Um, mm -hmm. It is good if you want to like start a company because he really gets in the nitty gritty of starting one, um, what mm -hmm. it's like to run a startup. Um, and now Gravity Sketch is like everywhere. It's used by individual artists to big corporations. And he talks about like Ford and HP. Um, mm -hmm. And I like how he also talks about uh, the software's like usability and the minimal interface. But as he says, the best interface is no interface. So not possible yet, but it's something that they're creating a more like minimal um, interface. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're, you you nailed all those things exactly right. I mean, it was very interesting. First of all, to hear his background, he's an engineering background, right? And what he did there. And then also what he got in, you know, what, what he did in school and how he came up with the idea of Gravity Sketch with him and his partner and how they did that, how they started the whole thing. Uh, how the, the 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 struggles of being a startup and getting funding and all of that, which was also fascinating. But then also what he says is like actually creating that program and how to understand VR and and what that is and the interfaces and how you interface. So it was he covers so many things. He's an extremely good speaker. I uh, loved listening really, to him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very well spoken and very eloquent. Uh, so I was very, uh, really fascinated. I'm actually really curious. I really want to meet his partner as well. She sounds amazing in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the other co founder of the company. So it'd be really great at some point. Maybe he can connect me with her and so find out all the cool stuff, her background. Uh, but it was really cool. And I met, I, I met Shay through again. I want to uh, uh, thank uh, Jean Michel uh, for introducing us. Uh, he was, Shay was also part of the real time conference uh, earlier this year. And and so that's how I was able to connect with Shay. So thanks again, Jean-Michel, for introducing me to all these amazing, interesting people that have been on the podcast. I really appreciate it. All right, Kristen, we have a couple of announcements. What's going on? Yeah, so you can find these out at chaos.com. We have V-Ray 5 for Cinema 4D Update 1 is now available. So go check that out. And then um, a couple weeks ago, V-Ray 5 for Maya and Hunidi, their Update 1 is available as well. And then Vantage Update 1.3. Perfect. So lots of new updates have been happening on our site. So go check it out, chaos.com. C4D has got a big new update. Go check that out. And we mentioned it a few weeks ago, like you said, V-Ray 5 for my and Houdini. The big thing there is USD, USD. Yeah, that's really, it's a big deal. Uh, not USB, USD, different things. So there's a lot of cool stuff going on in the USD area. V-Ray for Houdini has become an extremely mature product and I really like it. So, and um, our good friend Andre has uh, one of the driving forces behind that. So we really want to congratulate him, congratulate him and his team for the amazing stuff they've done. And of course, Vantage, we mentioned that also is also a big update for you guys who are interested in real time stuff. All right. But if people want to know more about the podcast, Kristen, where can they go? You can go to facebook.com slash CG Garage Podcast or chaos.com slash CG Garage. And if you'd like us like to watch us on YouTube, go to youtube.com slash chaos group TV. Perfect. Uh, and also, if you guys have ideas, we always are welcoming them. Just go to email us, labs at chaosgroup.com. We'd love your feedback or suggestions of other speakers or guests on the show. And we'd love to have those as well. And don't forget to uh, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this uh, these episodes with all of your friends on uh, whatever social media platform or did you want to do, or you can just do word of mouth. <laughs> Appreciate that too. All right. That being said, please enjoy this awesome podcast with Shay Sasanya, the co-founder and CEO of Gravity Sketch. Welcome to another CG Garage, where the chaos group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray And while image-based lighting is really swell You need to make sure everything has for now This is great. Thank you so much for doing this, Shay. I appreciate you doing a part of this. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I've always been very excited about the tools that you, got, that you are doing and that 
concept of a workflow has a lot to, uh, is more, more than just cool software, it's actually a completely different way of thinking about how we create things in the digital space. And I want to get into that. Uh, but just to give a little context, um, what's your background? How did you, how do you, how did you get involved in this? What, what's the journey that took you to, to doing things, to becoming, you know, starting this company and, and creating a really cool tool like Gravity Sketch? So what's that journey been like for you? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me as well, Chris. It's a pleasure to be on the podcast. Um, yeah, my background is in mechanical engineering. Um, mainly, I, I was working on manufacturing and lean manufacturing in particular. So I spent about three years in Taipei um, working for an OEM that produced laptops. Mainly, the main clients were like H HP and Microsoft and so forth. And mm. one of the challenges that I, I experienced during that time of work was the the conflict between engineering and design, it seemed like there was always this kind of back and forth. Uh, we, we speak the same language, but slightly different dialects. And so much to the point where, you know, design would kind of work in their own bubble, and engineering would work in their own bubble, and the paths would cross only to, you know, finalize something. And nine times out of 10, it was really hard to finalize something because not all the factors were taken into place. Like how how is this injection molding process going to work with, um, you know, maybe a sheet metal stamping process and how the components will fit together. And so... We were talking about these 3D ideas, but through our own 3D dialects, and those are usually through 2D means. And so um, that's what's encouraged me to maybe be the bridge between design and engineering and encouraged me to come to, to London to, to, um, to pursue a master's. And there I okay. found Daniela, that was my uh, co-founder, and she's kind of from the industrial design side of things. So she's coming from the opposite end of the spectrum, who also had the very similar thing of like, how do I learn more about how engineers are working so we can make better, more sustainable products? Right. So really, I mean, your, your background is I mean, obviously, you know, industrial design was like a big factor in, in what you guys are doing. And obviously very clear from the product that you guys make that the, there's a high influence, and especially in the tools. You know, this isn't, it's not exactly the same way as ZBrush. This is really about the industrial design process and how that, 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 that works, which is really cool. Uh, and it's definitely something I want to Again, uh, get to talk a little bit more, but so you have this idea of like, how do I make something? How do I build it, <laughs> right? How do I get? How mm. do I get this idea and make it build? And here's how, is, how do I communicate that idea more clearly for the for the engineer to do that? So that's your general thesis as your problem before you start your your company, right? Yeah. How do you materialize ideas more effectively, faster, less compromise? Um, just accessing ideas in a quicker way and sharing them. I mean, a sketch is nothing but a, a tool for communication. And mm -hmm. the effectiveness of a sketch is how well everyone that needs to, uh, I guess, work off of that sketch can read it and can work mm -hmm. with it. And so engineers end up drawing very, very particular plan views and, um, you know, maybe an isometric view that's very exact with exact dimensions. And designers have to convey emotion through a lot of their sketches as well. And so at the end of the day, we're just trying to communicate something. And if it's 3D by nature. That's these 2D methodologies of communication are slowing us down because our brain has to like interpret perspective, and we're not born with that at all. Uh, you know, you give any child a color crown and a piece of paper, ask them to mm -hmm. draw a car or an elephant or anything like that. All, all the wheels are in the same plane, all the legs are in the same plane. You know, there's no sense of perspective. You develop that over time, and and so if we can just remove that barrier, that extra compute power that the brain has to do through 2D mediums, uh, you know, possibly that will lead to a more effective communication stream that uh, yeah that's an excellent point um i came from the architecture world and i know exactly what you mean it was much easier not to deal with it when i started because back in the early 90s when i first started i was became you know part of the uh the 3d world and i was like yeah i don't have to worry about all that perspective drawing and how do i communicate this it's just done right i just use a click click yeah. camera to make the picture that i want but the communication is in 3d definitely <laughs> removes a level of complexity as you say um, okay, so when was this? When was this sort of this this meeting of the minds kind of happening? About what time? What, you know, yeah, this year? is this is 2012 actually. <laughs> so uh, yeah. we we, uh, we we both we're from the United States. I'm from the United mm -hmm. States. She's from Mexico, Mexico City to be exact. And so mm -hmm. um, we both decided to come down here to London or come over to London, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, to pursue a degree in in innovation design engineering. It was a joint master's course from Imperial College London and the Royal College mm -hmm. of Art here in London as well. And so you get a little bit taste of both worlds where they bring designers and engineers together. And I actually met Danielle on my first day here. We were on London Eye, the big Ferris wheel thing. And um, we, we didn't have the idea in that moment, but we, we met and kind of that's how we, we uh, started our friendship. 
And it wasn't until the second year of our master's studies where we were trying to like think of like what is the right way to uh, um, approach uh, a, a year long thesis. And we wanted to bring stuff from our background as well as things that we were learning in, in the realm of academia. And we just felt like this was a really strong connection. You know, how can we allow people to materialize their ideas faster, better, more effectively, more collaboratively? And at that time, you started to see things like the the Oculus Rift DK1. Um, AR was kind of a big thing with Euphoria and webcams. And, you know, it's it's much bigger now, obviously. But in terms of accessibility and being able to be a, a student, for example, and not a professional developer and, and access these tools, Unity at the time was really kicking off and uh, making it very accessible to develop on their platform. And so we just felt like it was the right timing with everything that was happening to make a, a proposition. And so we spent the the tail end of 2013 and then into early 2014 where we publicly displayed Gravity Sketch in its very raw form. You could still see some videos on YouTube. Um, it was a rough <laughs> tablet. The DK2 had come out, just come out. So we had that. You could strap that on your head. Um, you had this like little Perspex tablet, but we were tracking the surface with an IR uh, IR sensor and you had a pen that was tracked as well. So you can sketch and then you, we, we hacked a little Arduino with a joystick and you can like rotate the sketch around. So you can essentially just sketch plan views and then rotate them and, and build up from there. And that was the genesis. It was just like, you can, at least you can grasp this idea of 3d, but before any technology even came into play, we were playing and exploring in the space around like, how do we communicate, um, gesturally, how do we communicate uh, or how would we communicate with direct material manipulation if a, a sculptor or a glass worker? Um, the difference there is they need to have years of intrinsic knowledge of the material that they're manipulating. So it's not as easy or as fast of access to those ideas, but they still use sketching. Sketching seems to be the fundamental way that we communicate across disciplines, including contemporary art and dance. And so it just felt like this was, the, the again, the more natural way of just getting an, an early stage idea. Out. So we really want to leverage that that idea of a sketch. Yeah, that's really interesting that you say that because, you know, the more you're talking about it and how you sort of come up with the ideas, like I had to build an Arduino for this and, you know, try to figure it out. Really building the tool to make something better, you're actually solving a problem similar to that just to make the tool that you're doing. So you're building a tool to help make a tool and you're just right. solving similar engineering and design uh, uh, experiences on that, you know, just the idea of what is the t what is the thing the common thread of creativity is sketching, right? Right. And so that the that was a kind of an interesting creative uh, uh, a conclusion that you had to come up with. It's like okay, so we have to solve sketching. <laughs> we have to yeah. solve sketching in a different in a new in a new medium in a new way that's uh, that's three dimensional, uh, which is fascinating. Definitely, and we hadn't really seen too, too many things um, that were kind of going down that route, we have like really great way of sketching in Photoshop or even Illustrator has a nice pen tool. But when you go over to SolidWorks or Rhino, um, you actually have to enter point by point. And on top of that, you have to hit drop down menus or enter command or uh, you kind of got to know your way around the software. And in the mind of the creator, when an idea hits, you, you don't necessarily think of order of operations, right? You're just thinking about how do I just drop something in space? And so I spent quite a bit of time actually in in Grasshopper with Rhino trying to see if I can write something that would allow the user just to take the mouse and track the mouse and then create the, the spline in real time and sample the you know the, the the course of the mouse and so some of that stuff was like a little bit pedantic and I wouldn't really want to ever go do that again um, and and moving into Unity was much much more uh, uh, it was much more fluid for us and and, and easier and more accessible but. Yeah, it was like the, the idea was a sketch in a lot of ways, you know, so the word sketch for me now starts to fold into much bigger territory. Yeah, that's fascinating you say that because the 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 I was just thinking about like what it's like to, to draw. And yes, and of course you have the problem. Of, I, mean, I remember drawing drawing nerves back in the early days is like it this is slow <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's not exactly yeah. conveying the stroke that I would like to, to convey. No. <laughs> but the other problem you have is that you're all, no matter what you do, no matter how you rotate in space, you're basically still drawing on a plane. You're, right. And so you never have depth to any of your strokes as you're going through, mm -hmm. which honestly on a sketch on a piece of paper is the same problem, right? Right. So really you're inventing a new way of sketching where instead of just drawing like this you're drawing where sorry i'm using my hands for those of you yeah, who yeah, listen to the yeah. audio version yeah. of this <laughs> waving, waving your hand yeah, yeah yeah so you, instead of just drawing in this plane you can draw and then you can move your hand backwards and forwards and that continues the stroke of that sketch which is kind of an interesting concept 
uh, as well. Um, right. So what were some of the things, I mean, I'm sure as you started to think about this, there, there's sort of the, what kind of, did this sort of open your mind to di different ways of thinking? Did you find new, uh, new uh, uh, problems that this was creating or solving? Like what were some of the things as you started to think of that fundamental part of sketching in three dimensions? Yeah, well, it was really important for us to set uh, a set of design criteria or what we call our principles. And mm -hmm. we did we discovered these principles through some of those observations. We we observed, like I said, a ceramicist, glass blower, contemporary dance. Um, there was a few others, obviously industrial design and engineering. And those mm -hmm. who were like kind of the course that we automotive were design, on. I'm sure as well. <laughs> yeah, well, we we that comes later down the story where we uh, before right. we actually officially kicked off the company, we were recruited to JLR and worked at, at Jaguar. So that comes a little bit later down the line. Okay, but, yeah, we'll come we, we'll we'll come back to that one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so. Yeah, some of the things that we decided to, to put as our, our guiding principles was the thing had to be um, physical. So you had to actually be able to do something and produce something. Just like you put your pen to the paper, you drag it across the paper, you create a mark. Um, that was like a fundamental thing that needed to happen. You need to have some immediacy and some physicality. So actually physically moving your hand, not just clicking a mouse and pushing a button, and then having an immediate response. So those were two of the initial criteria. Um, and then the next one was a simple set of rules. So similar to like Lego or Etch-a-Sketch, these were some of our inspirations there where you give a creative, like a really defined criteria in which they can be creative within. And then the first thing they want to do is break it, which is great because you understand your limitations really early on. Whereas if you give someone some clay, it's the whole world is possible, right? It's, you, you know, it just really depends on how well you you can move the clay. And then the final one was language agnostic. And we really um, dove into Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence. It's a really interesting, fascinating theory, saying that the human brain is split up into these nine different intelligence, and we have varying degrees of proficiency in each. And the people that are more creatively inclined are more spatially aware, meaning they can see things fully 3D in their minds, place things in space, locate them, imagine things in, in full 3D shape, form, and volume. Uh, without the need to go through any kind of intermediate stage. Uh, however, going through sketching is a, a great way to convey the idea. And so could we just leverage the spatial aspect and make a tool that was really focused on spatial, not language, not mathematics, not logics, just focused on someone's spatial intelligence. And so that's really where the the push and the, the, the kind of pull towards the augmented virtual realities uh, really came into play because that would be a great way to just move around your space. And then if you can sketch dynamically in real time without the need to worry about the the sketch falling to the ground or, you know, you can, you can in theory, you can kind of have silly string and spray it in space, but it drops. Or mm -hmm. uh, one great inspiration that we had is the Picasso's light drawings are amazing, right? They stay still in motion, motionless in air right there where he left them, but he can't see them in real time. So those are kind of some, some of the kind of loose structure that we put into place. And those are kind of like the guiding principles to drive us towards this this direction. And this is pre diving really deep into into the technology side of things. Right, right. Now I have a, it's a this is a quick side side chat about it, but I want to hear what your thoughts are. Um, I've had uh, the the honor of having uh, Alex McDowell uh, and talk to him a few times about uh, some of the things that he did on Minority Report, including obviously the Minority Report interface that was invented, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, the, the 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 question I have is 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 this: like, there's been a lot of people who've talked about that interface and say that's the future of interfaces because <laughs> they thought it looked really cool, right? Right. But the reality is that a lot of people can't necessarily operate a computer in that way because it's exhausting, right? To wave mm -hmm. your hands around for hours would be really hard. So micro movements become an important part of the, the way that people need to operate in that, in that idea um, in order in the, to save literally energy. Uh, and so, but there is something to be said about using both hands in a much more intuitive way. How do you deal with that? Because, you know, there's big strokes and little strokes and then yeah. there's energy expanded on things. So how, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on, on, on the, the, how you deal with that in space uh, and in terms of create, creating things. Right. I mean, we have a great design team, so I have to really kind of give credit where credit's due to the design team that we've brought on board. Uh, and they really look at the, the kind of holistic picture, not just the limitation of the hardware. So 
it is mm-hmm. important to understand that we are limited by the gaming controllers that Oculus gives out we're, or, sure. or other hardware providers. We're not at all um, saying that this is the great, the best way, but we're going to work with what we have because it's the most accessible way. Hand tracking is not quite there yet, so that's a different way of kind of operating in this 3D space. But some of those natural tracking, te- uh, sorry, natural movements are, are really something that we try to leverage. So I think every application that's working in virtual reality right now has to kind of open your arms wide and, and pull your arms together to kind of scale and move yourself around. But, you know, when I think about the Minority Report or Iron Man, I, there's, I don't want to create like any animosity, but it's not really how the future computer is going to work. I feel like there's the future computer is going to have an element of, of voice input, um, an element of gaze, an element of... Um, you know, pressure and touch and input input and haptics. And the way that I try to encourage and inspire the team to think is, you know, how is your desk set up? Um, how is your kitchen set up? Um, I'm pretty confident, like, Chris, I can go to your house right now, walk into your kitchen, and I can start cooking an egg within 30 seconds. But I couldn't open up mm-hmm. your laptop and I couldn't start navigating files as easily. I, I would obviously know the operating system, but I wouldn't know your, your layout. I wouldn't know certain programs they may use. So, if you think in that way, like there's a lot of common, um, common kind of interactions and kind of common interfaces that we as humans interact with every day. And I gain a lot of inspiration from the user experience that you have with just riding the tube around London, or um, you know, when you walk into a department store, things are displayed in a certain way. They're enticing you to interact in a certain way, and that's the way that we want our, our interface to be laid out, especially if you're working in a spatial environment. Now the the opportunity that you have here is that you don't need to respect the laws of physics. And that right. poses a lot of great things, such as those micro movements you mentioned. And we have a couple of menus in, in Gravity Sketch where you just push a button and make a gesture and you kind of automatically change tools. So things like this we're learning and we learn a lot from the gaming industry as well. Um, mm-hmm. Gaming industry is great because they are a very fast, iterative, paced type of development cycle. And so they're testing out interactions in real time with thousands of users in the same environment. Uh, and so there's so much to learn from that, that way of, of developing as well. So uh, at first glance, uh, many customers looked at our interface and said, okay, it looks kind of too playful <laughs> because they were used to looking at, you know, an, an alias interface or a Rhino interface, which are right. very powerful interfaces, but they propose you with so many options at once. But once right. uh, users got through that and they realized that you don't need to have any of the panels open and you can access tools really quickly and close those menus, get them out of your way, it was really intuitive for them. And they felt like, okay, actually, I have everything I need at my fingertips. The menu is just there to convey um, a message. And over time, I think a lot of the things are going to be stripped away. And we often say the best interface is no interface, um, but that's pretty impossible. Uh, so it's about giving clues and creating um, references and also taking uh, the physical interface is really important in terms of your your physical input. When you have now you have gestures, you know what what shapes does your hand make? How far apart do you move your hands? Our color selector you actually depress to get the value, so you press the trigger and you move forward and you get darker um, shades of the color that you're wishing for. So those things are helping to remove and tear back little elements of the interface, and over time. Um, you know, I won't. Th- I don't ever think Gravity Sketch would be an invisible interface, but it would be a much na- more natural interface, and things would pose themselves in a much more gestural way and, and feel very familiar. Like a, a great um, example of a UX that I really love is our smart movement. So if you want to do a restrained movement, you often like have a gumball in an application. You click on the axis and you move it on the axis. Yep. Um, well, we went back to shop class thinking about how you were playing and push a piece of wood through the plane. You line up your two hands together and you push the wood through the plane or you shave the wood with a planer. And so you just right. line up your two controllers, you grab the content and you can just slide it along an axis. And everyone, once they get it once, it's like muscle memory. They, somehow it's like a, a natural thing. And so those are, the, those are the type of things that we're trying to pull from, like pull ideas and inspiration from the real world. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because, you know, I mean, I'm reminded of, you know, when when I first started getting into 3D many, many years ago, uh, you know, the whole point was like you get this piece of software and it came with manuals that were like, you know, four or five feet, right, of manuals right. that went through it. And you and you couldn't do anything until you'd let it, read at least the first book, which was like 400 pages, right? And that was just very, very uh, stressful. Uh, and it definitely made a barrier to entry in terms of learning the, the, the thing. And so, and it was just a difficult, challenging thing. And if those of you who want to do it, you could do it. 
Today, you can get your cell phone and it, you open it up and even if you've never used a cell phone, there's no instructions. Right, right. <laughs> you learn as you go and it's instruction and it becomes, it's very intuitive as you go. And that's why, you know, infants can use them at this point, right. which is really f- interesting. And the way you just describe what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, wait a minute, maybe we've been doing 3D software for a wrong, for a long time. Right, right. Uh, and it's really kind of interesting to think about what it's what it's like to to minimize the interface and it sounds like you're trying to minimize it even more like you you're not going to be satisfied until it's almost all gone yeah <laughs> well i think I, I feel like it should it should spawn like things should spawn up as you need them like if you don't have any content right. in the scene what's the point in having a, a bunch of uh, tools that are supposed to manipulate content if you don't if you haven't generated anything yet so i think there's a you know i'll, I'll zoom out cuz i can go super deep into this whole space but let me just zoom out and just say that i feel that uh, what you just said is 100% accurate. We've spent so much time on creating a really intuitive user interface for a smartphone, for a tablet, for even our computers these days. And we've done a, a huge disservice to the design industry, in particular the 3D design ecosystem. And we haven't created or put that type of time and energy and user research into tr- creating like 3D design tools for effective work. And, and same with engineers. I mean, engineers have great tools, but if I'm honest, like there's always ways to optimize some of these bloated tools that have legacy code and, you know, widgets all over the place that don't need to be there. So I think with the same kind of veracity and, 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 and vigor that we put into creating a calendar app, like why can't we do that in the design space? And that's, that's kind of our mission is like, we want to give it, give it the just do because at the end of the day, these tools are delivering everything in our built environment. The headset that you're wearing and I'm wearing, the chairs we're sitting in, the buildings we're inside, these all go through a digital pipeline. And Mm -hmm. people are painstakingly going through that process and losing man hours, losing time. If something is built wrong, it has to be tore down or it fails in in actually real world. So getting more heads around the table, having a really intuitive experience to communicate and collaborate and develop ideas is, I feel like is essential for everything that's going to come out of those products. And uh, right now- yeah, right now things are just coming out of SolidWorks, and it's a it's a cool experience because you can do stuff. But if you're not if you're not fluid in it, and it takes about six months to get there, maybe longer if you really want to get the whole breadth of the software, you're going to create subpar things, and it's just going to be. I mean, uh, now I'm going to go on a bit of rant, but I, you know, I can walk into a a, a furniture store or you know a, a high street brand store or something like that, and I can look around, and I can almost pinpoint what software was used to make certain things. Yes. Like, uh, you know, I have a knack for this now. <laughs> and- I, 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 I am going to tell you, I, guess I was going to exactly, you're following my train of thought because I was going to say the exact same thing. Architecture has the same problem, right? right? You look at architecture that's built today, it is very clear that it's architecture, like what designed that, right? Because yeah. of the importance that, 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 that tools like SketchUp and Revit have had on the world, it has created a certain type of architecture that mm-hmm. that is honestly speaking just not very um, innovative anymore. Right. And and you know and and in Rhino, for example, is Rhino is definitely has a role in architecture as well. But you look at a new building and it's like grasshopper, right? Exactly. <laughs> right? Pretty yeah. much made with grasshopper. That facade was made with grasshopper. No mm-hmm. one is really sort of letting the brain sort of do what it did originally, right? The the sketch on paper thing. Right. So how? Do you okay? With that being said, you can identify the software that's designed the the f- piece of furniture or the bowl or whatever. It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. that was you know a loft tool, and, <laughs> and that's exactly yeah. how it was made. But can you? What about your software? Do you think your software has a certain style or look to it that's going to change things, or do you think it's uh you know it's going to say oh do you think someone's like that was done in Gravity Sketch? <laughs> Well, you know, it does have a bit of that right now. And I think it's the way that we're generating our meshes and, and some of the, the ways that users are using it and unpacking some of the features. And so uh, when I see something on Instagram that has like equal thickness tubing, but in a very gestural way, I'm kind of like, okay, that's probably made with gravity sketch. But <laughs> you, what, what, I, what I like is that we offer this infinite customization of each piece of geometry in gravity sketch and um, all the messages, all the message per, meshes preserve some sort of um, parametric constraints. So in in theory, when you see a more professional gravity sketch user or someone that spent a little bit more time in the application, and, and, and on average it's eight hours of total play time in gravity sketch to be up to speed. Um, mm-hmm. But when we see someone that has like put in those six months, 
uh, it's really hard to just how to understand how they even made that stuff. It's like, did you spend months in Alias or, you know, how did you actually produce this? And that's what we're trying to march closer and closer towards. Like, how can this be a tool of trans translating your own unique design style into the digital space? And hopefully you could start bringing in engineers and really figure out if that's manufacturable or feasible. And so at the end of the day, I would love to see products on the market that are much more in line with, um, you know, that the human, the humanity, not necessarily the machine or the computer. And I understand that there's technological constraints of manufacturing and fabrication and yield and so forth. I've been down that for eight years in my professional career. Um, but I do think there is more space now and more room to have a bit more humanity in, in the products. And hopefully Gravity Sketch will become invisible uh, when we walk into shops and, and, and see things and maybe even thinking like, you know, if it is a bowl or a cup, it's like, or a vase, it's like, whoa, that must have been handmade. But no, it's actually, it was handmade digitally. <laughs> it, you know, right. That would be great. Okay. <laughs> that, 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 that brings up an excellent point. And I, and, in the, and I don't necessarily think it's the fault of the, of the software uh, industry. Well, of what they do. For example, if, let's, let's use uh, uh, Grasshopper as an example. Grasshopper could do a lot more, but sometimes people just never go beyond the default, right? right and they're right. like, ooh, that looks cool, and they'll they'll stop, right? Like I remember right. back at, again in the early days when I was using Wavefront, uh, and I was mm -hmm. helping a, a architecture professor in Wavefront, and there was a, the default color in Wavefront was this kind of a nice-looking blue, and he was just going off about how he loved this blue as part of the architecture. It's like it's the default color, dude. And it's yeah. like, and I was like, okay, if you like the color, that's cool. But now it just looks like a wavefront default color. Like anyone right. who knows wavefront is gonna, can see it, just like you say. I oh, see that. That's exactly the same mm -hmm. tool. Or I can look at a, a facade and say that was done with with, mm -hmm. with uh, Grasshopper. So it's it's the it's it's interesting to to sort of sort of encourage people to go beyond the defaults or beyond. Right. What, uh, so I, how do you how do you yeah. how do you do that? Well, I mean, that's the that's the challenge, right? It's you get inundated with the same look when you open the software every single day, right? And so, you know, some of the the icons in Photoshop, I'm like, why is that the icon? I haven't seen a I haven't seen a physical stamp, you know. And I imagine, you know, I have a I have a young niece; she's never seen a physical stamp in her whole life. So why is that the default? Right. It's really really weird. But is there no other way to express that? But so I think we get inundated with these me messages and images. Even in Gravity Sketch, we have a hard disk, for example, for save. Like, right. you know, so many people never use like hard disks or anyways. Right. So it's, it's yeah. kind of like, how did we move so, beyond Someone this? showed, I think someone showed a kid a, a floppy disk and it's like, oh, you 3D printed the save icon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. That's yeah. exactly it, right? So this is the challenge. And so to encourage people to move beyond the default, I feel the first thing is to to get the default so minimum that there's... There's almost no default in a lot of ways. It's like, yeah, okay, the color, it's going to be hard to get around the color. We, we choose gray because gray is the absence of color. So you, you first mm -hmm. launch into Gravity Sketch, you have a gray environment. That's not very pleasing to anyone. It's not supposed to be abrupt and, and harsh, but Rhino does a very similar thing. It's, it's okay, this is all business now. Go in here. But you're able to start making a sketch, and you can change the color. And so you almost start to define your own journey into like the settings and the, the avenue into Gravity Sketch. And I think... When you talk about the defaults in Grasshopper, uh, you know, I spent almost 11 years um, using Grasshopper uh, well into like, academia, right? It has so much potential, but you need to have a lot of understanding, not just of the software, but of mathematics to really unleash its potential. So anyone can do a box more if you can watch a YouTube video and get there. And so I think there's also that limitation, right, of... of you know, how much time do these projects have? And a lot of this stuff that I see in, in Grasshopper that is really groundbreaking is research work. It's people that are working academically and, you know, they can afford the time to go forward with that. And so, you know, I started to see um, a couple of guys online making shoes and there's a, a one designer, um, he's, he's, just, uh, he's just joined a, a major footwear brand. He took this, this kind of the, the shell or the, the exoskeleton of a, a lobster as inspiration and he just started physically manipulating surfaces in gravity sketch to give it this kind of same like you know how lobsters have these little like little bumps and it's for aerodynamic mm -hmm. aerodynamics and the, the the i think the joke he made was that lobster is more aerodynamic than a race car um, and it actually <laughs> it actually is right it's billions of years of evolution or millions of years of evolution right and but but the fact that he was doing this like mimicking nature physically in the digital space i felt like that was so much more powerful than anything he could have done in 
in Grasshopper at the time because you just you need so much um, mathematical knowledge and coding knowledge to really unlock that type of generative yes. um, behavior. Whereas we can mimic and be generative to some degree. You know, it's not real generative, but it's it's mimicking that. And I think well, that's, it's that's probably right? <laughs> yeah. It's like it's you know it's you're sculpting. And mimicking how a lobster's, you know, shell looks uh, on a shoe, and how that might look if you're creating an aquatic type of footwear. So I think those are also the things like where we can encouraging people to bring other content into the platform, um, showing that there's a community around it. I think that's really important. A great thing that Rhino has done is built out their community, and uh, and having design competitions and challenges, like really just trying to engage people. Uh, we give out a headset a month. To, to, to folks so we try to get you know we're doing our part we're obviously a small startup but we're doing our part to mm -hmm. kind of uh, make adoption grow and, and get people to think really critically about their current workflow and and how this tool can potentially have an effect on it that's awesome that's awesome uh, sorry we took a little detour i want to get back to your history a little bit so obviously you guys are creating this you know you're you're doing as part of your thesis sounds like it definitely was part of yeah. your thesis and that was the genesis of how you guys get started so what ha tell us about you know presenting that thesis and how that sort of led to you guys saying well, we'll just keep going and make a company out of this yeah yeah so um we have this uh graduation show and it, it happens at two periods of the year one's like a midway point and the other one's a final show and mm -hmm. uh, the, the midway point was in February of 2014. And we had had this really cool prototype of Gravity Sketch. We had tested it with AR glasses, actually. Um, we had the Oculus that we were running with the Oculus as well. Um, small AR company in France called Lester Technologies. They primarily develop AR glasses for, the, for aerospace and defense. Mm -hmm. um, they loaned us a headset and we were playing with that. Uh, and so we had we'd shared it to our tutors and we had gone through like kind of the formal critique and review process. and. The um, the school had come to us right before we were going into this um, this exhibition. It's open to the public and other students and so forth. And they said, "Hey, um, we really like you to file some intellectual property here because, you know, we think you have something here." And uh, we were just like, "No, we're not really interested in like filing IP. Like, you have to defend it, and it costs a lot of money. We just want this to be an inspiration project, and hopefully, you know, a company like Adobe or a company like Autodesk." you know, get inspired by this idea and, and, and really start building something around it. That was kind of our, our initial thought was almost like mm -hmm. a concept car in the automotive industry. Since working in automotive, I'm, I'm always talking about the concept car because it does set, it sets the face of the brand for the next 10 years or so. And so we wanted right. to do that for the, the digital design industry. Um, but they said, hey, no, we'll pay for it if you put in a year after graduation. And we said, okay, well, that sounds pretty interesting. But, you know, that okay. year would have to be, we'll moonlight it, you know. And right. uh, and so in that show, kind of running around, roaming around the space, because we, we were positioned right next to the automotive school, uh, the School of Automotive mm -hmm. Design, uh, where where some people from the Jaguar, um, there's called Design Enabling Technologies team, and uh, they spotted us and they said, hey, we really like what the work that you're doing and the thoughts that you're you're kind of bringing forward, and we'd love to you to join our team. And so we thought that that was like a perfect uh, balance. You know, they understood what we were working on so we can get a little bit of leeway in terms of the scheduling and time to, to do some work with Gravity Sketch and at the same time get a, get a salary um, working at, uh, at JLR and learn a lot from the automotive industry. And so we both went um, two feet into the auto space and worked uh, at Jag Jaguar Land Rover for two years and learned a ton about um, design, engineering, manufacturing. And one of the things that stood out to me so prominently from the IT space versus the automotive space is that like the time and attention and detail that is put into the design of a car is it's so much more immense than what's put into um, a, a computer, a phone, a game console. And it makes a lot of sense because about 95% of the vehicles on the road are, are identical under the hood. They have to pass the same safety requirements. They have to host the same number of occupants. They have to go from zero to 60 in the same time frame. And you're just buying its aesthetics. You're buying the interior, the exterior, and it's a status symbol. You're almost like buying something that shows who you are in this position in society. So much so that marketing teams actually drove a lot of the design briefs uh, in our studio where, you know, marketing, we'd have marketing reviews quite frequently. And if you think about mm. the development of a vehicle, you know, you have a six year time frame. So you have to start designing six years before that thing hits the road. And you have to almost predict, you know, what is Chris going to like in six years? What kind of devices is he going to bring into the vehicle? How many kids is he going to have? You know, like those are the things that marketing was bringing to us as a design team we had to work with. And, uh, 
a car car is just a beautiful thing not for the the, the kind of obsession over the the vehicle and like the, you have the engine but the idea that we're driving sculptures down the road these things aren't aerodynamic <laughs> you know they're they're not they're not meant to to fit like a maximum capacity of occupants or we'd be driving f1s or buses right there there are they are sculptures and they're Every every car that came out of uh, of, of the studio that we were working on was was sculpted in clay one to one multiple times before it was ever fabricated, and each mm-hmm. one of those clay models can cost anywhere from, you know, uh, uh, let's say fifty sixty thousand to two hundred fifty thousand uh, a piece, mm-hmm. and then there were multiple of these models because they had to get it just right. You know, when you hit the car lot, you, the car speaks to you. It's a sculpture, so. This was a great learning opportunity for us because the the budget for design in automotive and industries where the value proposition to the end customer is the design is so high, it's so great, and um, and they really kind of pull out all the stops for the design team, and that gave us a lot of conviction, understanding, and learning how that industry worked. That we should really pull this technology in and 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 try to see if we can adopt this within this within this environment. Unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of success there um, because it is a very hierarchical company and you have to work within, you know, time frames. And there's a productivity delta curve. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but every time you adopt a new mm-hmm. process, you lose time. And that period of disruption yep. could, could cost too much money. And we didn't have any of the answers for that. The, the software wasn't fully fleshed out. Uh, so Daniel and I, I just decided um, about the tail end of 2016, um, just on our second end of our second year at Jag- Jaguar Land Rover to to go full time on this and spend all of 2017 really building out um, a solution. And in the interim, we 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 met Daniel Thomas, our CTO, um, made him a, a co-founder, and uh, he has a background in theoretical theoretical physics from Cambridge, um, and is a self-taught game developer. So he was really excited about the opportunity to to develop a geometry engine on Unity and and kind of bring all these components together. And so we spent a good chunk of 2017 just building the tool. Towards the tail end of 2017, we started to present this to the community. We said we got to get people using it, like the same way people get games, game, get games out in the in the beta kind of ecosystem. So we did that through Steam. It was the only mm-hmm. provider of VR solutions at the time. And um, in our first month uh, on the Steam platform, we had this little link on our website. We can download a, a key if you donated twenty five dollars via PayPal. And so mm-hmm. we had done about 10,000 USD in the first month. And we said, okay, there's something here. <laughs> there's like, yeah. there's a hunger for things that aren't games in the VR space. And that yep. was enough. That was definitely enough to get investors interested in us. And uh, we pitched to about 54 investors and only one, only one uh, gave us, gave us the, uh, gave us the, an offer for, for a, a term sheet. And we took that okay. around and we got, um, we got, a, we got two other investors on board, one in, in, in the Bay area and the other was Wacom. So I don't know if you're familiar, familiar, you're yeah, familiar yeah. with Wacom. Yeah. So Wacom um, met with the CEO in Japan and he had this really great vision of, you know, moving into 3D at some point. They're a very strong 2D design application um, companion, uh, hardware, piece of hardware, but moving into the mm-hmm. 3D space. And, you know, if you look at the biggest companies in the world, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Apple, everyone's exploring this AR, VR territory. And so, you know, his vision was to definitely be the creative companion for the, for the, for the uh, AR, VR space. And, and, then, and I can't say what they're doing right now, um, but it was a great vote of confidence. If you have the kind of market dominant um, companion hardware for, for the 2D creative world, um, that would set us up really nicely for the 3D creative world. And, and, and maybe we can work as a companion or partnership, I guess, together. And that, that's really the ambition of having them on board. So yeah, that was 2018. We, we had uh, 1.5 million USD in our first round of investment um, as our pre-seed round. And we really um, decided to build a team on the back of that. So three people <laughs> trying to, to build a company. And it, it, was a, it was a very, very fun learning experience, but uh, it was also a lot of hard work. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, that experience alone, uh, you know, it's interesting when you do that. You start with all that learning. It's like, okay, I'm learning all about uh, car manufacturing. I'm learning all about this. And then suddenly it's like, now I have to learn how to start a business. And that is a completely yeah. different, <laughs> different thing. And presenting, uh, you said you did 54 presentations to different yeah, groups? Yeah, pitches. Yep. 
yeah, yeah. 54 pitches it was a lot of a lot of admin work and you have to prepare spreadsheets that talk about your financial plan and all that stuff goes yeah. out the window the second that you get the check because you you start yes. to think about different things that you haven't thought about before and you, you know we we started to sell to automotive uh, almost immediately um, would take multiple trips to detroit to to present to ford um, which was mm -hmm. our first flagship customer and you know, really think about how much the legals are going to cost. And if you don't do a contract properly, you could get, you know, in a very serious situation where you don't actually own some of the, the things that you develop in, in conjunction with the customer. And so, yep. you know, all these things that we never really thought about started to come to the surface. And so your financial models go out the window um, the second that you right. start engaging with customers. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, really interesting. Uh, and a good, good advice for anyone who wants to do a startup. Just think Definitely. about your legal fees. <laughs> Maybe a little right. more than you expected. Yeah, always uh, add a margin, add a bit of a buffer for legals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. Well, that was uh, that's really, really fascinating. Okay, so so I just want to just keep going on, on this. So so you you've got your startup going now. You've got it. You've got it developing, and it's around when 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 did you get that first round? About two seven end of two thousand seventeen. You said right. Uh, it was the first first month of 2018. We had we'd done all the pitching and everything, and so obviously the people kind of hang out for the winter or for their Christmas mm -hmm. break, and so we came back and we really pushed hard to get get it closed by that time. Great, great. Well, I mean, gravity. I, I mean, I, I I live in the 3D world a little bit, so I, gravity sketches is actually a quite common name these days, right? Mm -hmm. And I also think what's also great is that you mentioned it's like yeah, maybe VR isn't just for games, which I could have told you that back in 2014. Because mm. I knew that, like, this is going to be VR. Was everyone kept thinking it's a way to show movies, which was like doesn't make any sense. No. And it's a way, and it's a way to play games. It's like I think there's way more use for it as an enterprise creative group uh, that it can do right, and, right. and the way that it that it works. And and you know, again, like my, you know, a little bit of bias. My my background is in architecture as well. I've done a lot of the visual effects works as well. I've, you know, have had many careers, but the back background is like an architecture. This is perfect. This is a way for me to see things to scale, right? And and that's something that's pretty special. Uh, and especially if you're designing uh, uh, industrial design as well, I can say it's like, yep, I can see that vase at the right scale, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. sometimes like, oh wait, this is way bigger than I thought it was going to be, mm -hmm. or whatever. <laughs> but now if you have it in VR, you can say exactly what it's supposed to be. So that's that's really, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It totally makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say I have to give some give some respect to the gaming and entertainment industries because the the cost of these devices would be astronomical if we didn't have the gaming community behind it to drive price down. I mean, if you think about it, the the cost of the enterprise exclusive AR headset from Microsoft is roughly three grand. I would I yeah. would I'm pretty confident that if Oculus Quest wasn't a Facebook product that was targeted towards gamers it would be around that kind of two grand to three grand price point. Because if you think about what's in there and you think about the technology that they have to build and, you know, the, the work from the, the SDK side of things, and it, it's just, there's a lot there. So right. I feel like, I feel like we, we got so lucky here that the gaming community had taken onto this because it, it drove the cost down for everyone else. And now, you know, we have jewelry makers, one man shops using gravity sketch to create the little, um, um, maquettes that they can send and have 3d printed in wax so they can have the investment casting done so you know i think without without the gaming community this technology would be far too expensive for anyone to access for for a lot of meaningful yeah. work that's a fair point and we should definitely thank the gaming community for doing that because the, the, the gaming community honestly has done a lot even in the visual effects world right now mm -hmm. you can see what's happening there and 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 how people are using those tools because before then you're like eh. Or right. use whatever tools you know Autodesk gives me, but now it's like, oh yeah, so we can do a little bit more, uh, which is which is great. I'm also like fascinated, but you know, we're talking about glass blowing. I could say it's like, oh, I can totally see uh, Gravity Sketch how that could change the way you think about things because glass blowing is so much more three dimensional, and it is harder right. to sketch something that's glass blown, but right. to visualize it in 3D sounds perfect. How did, did do you have guys a lot of customers in that area, or how did how's that? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, we don't have any customers in that area as of yet. What, what, how that kind of came about was in the school, uh, in in the Royal College of Art, we had a couple of different floors, and you'd have like textiles on one floor, and you'd have, um, you know, a, a wood shop on another floor, and we had our kind of innovation center on one floor, and then there was this glass and ceramics floor, 
And we kind of, uh, Daniel and I just had scoured all the different floors to see different creative processes because we were really interested in how people were germinating ideas in the very beginning and kind of not just communicating with others, but communicating with themselves. Like, how do you explore an idea and f flush it out? And um, when we got into the glass and ceramic, we were just mesmerized because you have these these fire hot kilns pulling out like this liquid molten glass. And so it was more of like a, you know, the shiny object kind of thing for us. And we're like, oh, let's like, let's talk with these people and see how they're, you know, making their, their objects. And, and you know, we spent credible time in, in this, in the, in the fashion departments as well, but that was kind of where that came about. And, um, you know, we had a, we had a, some tests where people were kind of playing with things, but I think through the nature of that craft, like hand glass blowing, um, it is more of a discovery process. And that's what's so beautiful about it. If you understand how to work with that material, you actually just start blowing the material and you start discovering the form as it comes to life, or you've done a certain kind of interesting thing that gets you inspired and then you can kind of repeat certain patterns. So um, that was that was kind of where, where that angle came from, but they still sketch. And like their sketches are really interesting. They're like organic blobs with little things coming out, but they know how to translate that to the material, which is really interesting. So... I think for someone that maybe doesn't have access to a glass uh, blowing facility with a, with a kiln, you know, they can never turn the kilns off as well. You just they have to keep them on all the time. So there's a big cost. Yeah, there, it probably but... takes like three days to warm up, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyone that, has, that doesn't have access to those facilities, I think it's a really great tool to explore and, and, and ideate. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what I also find interesting is that, you know, you are constantly, uh, you're at an opportunity to look at constantly new industries could benefit from the tools that you're giving, right? You didn't say we are only targeting this particular customer. You basically mm -hmm. said, oh, this is a very open-ended product and maybe other people need to discover what our tool can do and how they do that. Do you spend a lot of time saying, hey, you know what, let's go into fashion. Let's see if we can get people <laughs> in fashion involved or, 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 you know, whatever. How do, how do you, how do you explore that? I mean, we started with the most expensive product that you would purchase in your life, right? The, the, aside from your home would be the, the car, right? right? And so we, we, uh -huh. okay, we could start here and we work our way, work our way down. Um, <laughs> yeah. But in parallel, we've never made it an exclusive product to a, a business. We've always had this, um, kind of prosumer category. And we, you know, in January this year, we made it free. So anyone can just download it and use it. And we monetize on customers that want the uh, intellectual property security of our cloud services. So, so it's kind of a very similar model to what Google might offer. And, and we mm -hmm. felt like that was the right way of going about it. But because going through that, we start to, just by proxy, we get to see the community grow and develop. And we get to see, um, you know, who's coming to the platform, why they're coming and what they're trying to do. Uh, when we, we we did a bunch of customer interviews over the past few months here since since January and really learned, wow, okay, like there's people that are doing some of the most odd things like creating, you know, masks for, uh, for a play in Gravity Sketch, you know, mm -hmm. and it's because they don't have the tools to actually build the, the 3D model for 3D printing, you know, or they don't have the tools to ideate and express to someone that has to actually make, make it by hand some of these things that they're trying to achieve. So for us, it's it's really exciting to see that. But we, from a business perspective, we're a 30 person team. So we have to really take a bit of um, a bit of caution on what we decide to double down on in terms of building out feature sets or engaging with and, and trying to build them into an enterprise customer. Because at the end of the day, we love to service everyone with our enterprise offering, but we have to kind of work our way down from the companies that are really kind of have the strictest criteria and are willing to, to compensate uh, us with, you know, with uh, respectively for, for that, for that kind of um, those services. But me personally, and the goal that, and the vision that we have for the brand is to be, a, you know, a, a, a more utilitarian type of tool. Uh, and I really like Adobe for this, right? My mother is a school principal. She resizes mm -hmm. photos in Adobe. Maybe we'll make a, um, a card or a bulletin for her school. And then you go to Jaguar Land Rover and these designers are creating beautiful sketches uh, in, in Photoshop. And then you go to the New York Times and they're doing layout design and in, in, in InDesign and so forth. So, you know, it's one of those things that kind of kind of can span various different skill sets and various different industries. And we'd like to be in that that same um, bucket. Don't We don't necessarily right. want to just get one or two verticals. We want to have like a really broad spectrum and the grand vision, you know, with our collaboration tools, we haven't really talked a lot about this, but this is a, a huge uh, part of our offering is being able to collaborate simultaneously in the same space. And 
since the pandemic, we've seen a huge pickup in those features from our customers where they, they're collaborating from different parts of the same city or different parts of the globe. That has opened up our eyes here internally, along with our geometry engine of, you know, what does this look like for schools or academics trying to teach complex uh, mathematics or chemistry, you know, molecular bonds and things like this. Like those are all 3D ideas that we're trying to explore through a chalkboard or through a whiteboard or through Zoom now. How do how would we actually do that remotely in virtual reality with students and give them the real full understanding or even anatomy of the body? Um, so there's a lot of different avenues that we we feel this technology can move into. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's just, just everything you just said has just made my brain go like, wait, hold on a second. There's so much more this can do. So you, there's definitely a huge amount that you're you the potential that you're you're offering, and it's interesting. It leads leads to my 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 question, which you've already started to answer. It's like, what is your future? You mentioned collaboration. You mentioned uh, education. You mentioned uh, you know just any kind of illustration that illustrates an idea of some kind. Right. What is your, what is the, uh, what is the thing that you'd like uh, this product to be and where do you think it's going to go? Well, our mission has always been to help teams work more effectively um, with their digital media or with their ideas and bring them into, into reality, whether it's virtual reality or physical reality. So we want to continue in that mission, but there's a lot of things that also align with that mission of letting people I, generate their ideas more effectively. And I think that every company kind of goes through a metamorphosis where they can, they get to a certain size and they transition, you know, um, you know, Google is helping organize the world's information, but they're doing so much more now. They're, they're helping teams organize their, um, you know, providing new services for, for, for small businesses as well. So I think, you know, right now what we're still trying to do is help teams really work more effectively, especially in this time of, of remote working where, you know, there's, there's nothing that will ever replace a design studio, but hopefully a, a virtual 3D design studio gets close to that. Um, but where we do see things moving is if you have an idea, nine times out of 10, that idea is 3D. And if you can just really quickly represent that idea in 3D in real time and share that with someone, that's going to be the, the best way to, to kind of convey what's in your mind. And so we would love to build a platform that can have uh, you know pr probably pretty hardware agnostic. You can you can kind of zoom into a 3D session through a, a web viewer. You can use AR on your phone, your iPad, and and join from AR. Someone can be in VR. You can have a discussion. Potentially, there's an API. Um, you know, this is actually not potentially. This is a few. You're asking the vision. This is the vision mm -hmm. where people mm -hmm. can build products on top of the, the 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 platform that we've built. And so you know you can have a plugin for potentially doing some some chemistry and and kind of molecular bonds and right. things like that we can share with students. And so really making it um, making it accessible to leverage the geometry engine, our UX and UI interaction scheme, as well as our real-time collaboration and, and connectivity. Uh, that's the, 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 big, the big vision here. But our main focus yeah. will obviously stay in that kind of creative discipline realm, but we see that there's going to be, you know, if you build it as an open platform, there'll be more ways to, to kind of be more inclusive that way. Yeah, I can definitely see it as being a platform for illustrative ideas, especially yeah. if you create a, 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 an interface that's intuitive that y people can leverage right. to make make sense. Uh, well, this listen, uh, I you know don't want to take up too much more of your time. This has been a fascinating conversation. I could yeah. actually go on for a while about this, uh, but it's it is a great it is a great it's definitely a great tool. I love the idea of how much it has to offer people, uh, how much it, you know people think about what it it can uh, can do. Obviously, on a creative side of things, but also you thinking about how people use things, you know, and the idea of thinking of how people use things is very, uh, is a fascinating thing. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, like you mentioned, you know, obviously uh, it's, uh, it's available on many platforms so people yeah. can try it out. So get, let, let, you know, just give people a quick rundown. If people want to try it out, where can they, where can they go and what's the best way for them to give it a, give it a go? Yeah. So we recommend going and buying an Oculus Quest 2 of the Oculus App Store. Grab your sketch is free there. If you have an iPad with a pencil, you can grab it on the App Store. It's free on iPad. Mm -hmm. We just re-released that uh, in March. Um, so we'll be doing a, a big update by, by the end of the year. Right now it's really focused on sketching there. Um, and then Instagram and, and visit our website, get a, get a bit of information. Uh, we have a Discord channel as well with a very active community and in every one of these interviews, I always like to thank our community publicly because honestly, we wouldn't be as far as we are today without them. 
So if you do become part of our community, you're part of the family, you're helping build this product and, and really accelerate this uh, into into the areas that we have yet to, to understand. And so, yeah, please engage with engage with us on, on those platforms, even if you haven't tried the tool. We'd love to hear your thoughts and, and where you'd like to see uh, a product like this kind of help alleviate some of the stress or some of the, the challenges in your workflow. Great, great. Well, it's strange that you're the, one of the, you know, obviously it's interesting. I mean, I followed the VR world for a while since the uh, DK1, which was pretty much just a ski mask with a phone attached to it. Right. <laughs> but I, 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 I do, you know, I, it is kind of interesting to, to think about how much things have, have evolved, but it definitely seems like the, 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 the Quest 2 really sort of broke broke that barrier. It's a price right. point that's extremely affordable uh, and the product just is very, very versatile. So it really seems that, uh, you know, uh, Facebook should be commended for the, that bringing, bro- lowering that barrier and accessibility yeah, to everyone. It's just so accessible. And, and you know, I, I feel like it's at a price point now where you, you can't be indifferent about the technology. You either, either like it or don't like it, I, but you have to have an opinion. And so I always right. encourage people to go and investigate it, have an opinion. It's, it's half the price of a smartphone, right? It's, it's, you know, maybe it's a, you know, you just get a cheaper phone. Don't get the, the pro max phone from Apple, get the, get the, get the regular one, you know, so you can get yourself a, a, an Oculus quest and actually investigate the space. And if the biggest companies in the world are investigating 3d and investing a lot of dollars into 3d, I feel like any creative should definitely get involved and think about it, especially people that are creating products in that same, in that same ecosystem. Yeah. 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 Uh, just, just, Personal question: I uh, because I needed a uh, uh, something that would robust tracking, and uh, my friend Kevin Mack recommended I check it out. I got I ordered for work a uh, Valve Index <laughs> that I'm going to be Great checking headset. out. Great so it's headset. a good headset, and it's supposed to have some really good hand controllers. So I'll be able to use Gravity Sketch in that and check it out as well. Yeah, yeah, we're on Steam as well. So yeah, let's not forget Great. we have Oculus Store, Steam, and we have the App Store um, for the iPad. Perfect. So free on all platforms check it out and uh come to our website go to linkedin instagram we're we're kind of all over the place and we're just having conversations okay that's awesome well shay thank you so much for doing this fascinating things you are an excellent communicator which is probably one of the reasons you've gotten uh, your funding so uh (laughs) done which is great uh i'm really inspired by 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 what you're doing and i think that's uh that you know you're you're trying to take on something that's been very well established for a long time and that definitely needed some disruption so i'm very excited about everything that you guys are doing so thank you so much for being on the podcast and giving us this rundown of what you guys are doing awesome thanks chris i really appreciate the opportunity